So um, why don't we just collect, say, three questions to start, and then I'll give the speaker some time to respond. And, and please, questions, not, not long, not too long comments. Please. That's um, okay. I'm Sylvia from Ghana. I work with the Institute of Statistical Social and Economic Research, ESA. Um, I like the note on which you ended. That's to the last present, the, uh, the last presenter. A leader is a leader only because of his people. Yeah. And to Abdullah, um, I believe you are from the north. You are an elite, and you are advocating for your people which is very, very good. But in my opinion, I think you shouldn't neglect or you shouldn't close your eyes to the, the marginalization that happens in the South. Because all that I always say is that as, as um, citizens, we should learn to vote not on ethnicity. We should get the people who can do the job. Because already the framework of our, I mean, our, you know, our legislature and everything is that then we have enough national representation. So if you say, if, I'm not, if we don't have um, a southern president, nothing is going to happen in the north. Or if we don't have a northern president, nothing is going to happen in the south. It's wrong. Until le our leaders learn to have the national interest at heart, no matter where they come from. We are not going anywhere. Really, we are not going anywhere. So when you are appointed as a leader in the nation, make sure whether it is the south, it is the north, wherever, east to west, let it work for the interest of the country. Because, yes, we have um, currently the situation in Ghana where, Abdullah, I'm sure you know, we have a northern president at the moment. Funds that are supposed to go to the north for, for, I mean, poverty reduction are being misused. So will you tell me it's because he's from the north or from the south? No. And the nature and the structure of all this happens not from one leader to the other. It's been colonial. Colonials, during colonial rule, they came to settle in the south, build infrastructure in the south. Okay, so government, subsequent governments have been trying to bridge the, the, the gap between the north and the south. So let's work together as Ghanaians, as one people. That I believe in developed countries happen as much, no matter where they come from, they want to develop the nation at large. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the gentleman in the back here. Thank you. I'm Amar Khan from UNDP. My first question is for uh, Abdullahi. <clears throat> you uh, presented some figures for poverty in the North and Northwest. Uh, it's one of the poorest countries. At the same time, you said those are the areas where you produce rice for exports. So something seems to be missing there. Um, unless, say for example, there are some price controls or enclave economics like mining uh, where you produce but uh, within limited group is producing the exports. So something is missing there. Uh, the second question goes to Beatrice uh, on the trash collections. I'm wondering whether the trash collected are used to uh, used for productive purposes, like, say, for example, producing fertilizer. There are several examples elsewhere where you can use trash for productive purposes, especially when the fertilizer prices are very high. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the wo woman in the front here. Hi, I'm Catherine Rosner from JZ. Um, I have two questions. One goes to the first speaker. Thank you for your um, presentation. Or for, thank you to the three of you. Um, my question will be, uh, your conclusion or one of the things you said was, okay, in general, sub-Saharan African institutions provide poor services and, and so on. I was just wondering if, maybe not in this paper, but in one of your papers, you looked a little bit at 
um, the distributional effects of institution according to either if it's a research country or not, for example, are maybe resource, we all know the resource course theory, so does it have any effect on, on the distributional capacity of these institutions? And does uh, the colonial past matter? Do institutions in French-speaking countries and, and British former colonies or Belgian, does that make any difference? I was just wondering. Um, and then for, yeah, for Ghana, um, my question would be, yeah, would, what do you think that maybe, because you mentioned, okay, the, the problem also is an ideological one that we can look at, at some indicators that we have in this working for donor organization. I know that very well. Often you have to fulfill some indicators to, for everybody to be happy. And um, do you think a shift from away from the poverty line approach to more, okay, inequality indicators could also shift the idea first of donor organizations and second then also of partner governments to yeah, a more, more equal distribution within the country as well. Great. Uh, let's get one more question and then I'll give our, our um, presenters some time to respond in the back. Thank you. A, a quick comment and a question for, to Beatrice. Uh, last year I attended a, a meeting at the Cl uh, Clinton Global Initiative. I'm not going to mention any names, but one person high up in the, in the, in the foundation, in the initiative, claimed that uh, no mayor would be elected or re-elected because of trash collection. And you, you prove that that is wrong. I, I, and there are even some examples in the U.S. history. New York mayors were re-elected or not re-elected on trash issues. So that, that shows that how even people high up in the hierarchy in the donor uh, community are not um, aware or downplay the importance of waste collection or waste management in general. Uh, it's a neglected issue. And uh, also uh, following up, the person from uh, UNDP, uh, yeah, uh, are they trying to promote uh, not only composting of organic waste, but recycling uh, activities, paper, plastics, metals, and so forth? Uh, in many uh, uh, places that I've been, there is, there are informal uh, people already doing, uh, uh, doing, doing this. But are there uh, formal efforts to promote this? Okay, thank you. Um, why don't we have um, responses from our presenters, then we'll start with our first presenter. I have been listening to, to <laughs> presentations and I really found some complementarity, though I gave very general views about the institutional role, but the um, point, I think, the last uh, presentation, they mentioned how important, uh, you know, democracy, accountability, and that's linked to, to social contract. It's very uh, public goods provision and how that is financed. That sort of engagement is needed at different levels. And what I found in Africa, nation state building has been very difficult because that layer of structure, institution configuration was not there. And at the central level, leaders didn't have institution structure to engage with domestic stakeholders. And in the particular, initially I said, you know, leaders were personal, not the impersonal state structure was built. And then in the period of uh, institution reforms which are instigated because of that uh, crisis by uh, international organizations, uh, in particular World Bank IMF, that time government were signing dotted lines of reforms, but they are not engaged domestic stakeholders. And uh, to, to your questions, a lot of resource-rich countries, leaders, didn't need to engage because they could manage to deal with transnational corporations and with other things, getting rent, mineral rent, natural resources, and not, not really uh, their accountability was needed to get tax collections that they can manage predatory getting their 
interest, their own political leaders' interest could be secured and no accountability. So issue is how to make, you know, at many levels, uh, uh, municipal level and all this engagement coalition of people who are getting engaged in in public goods and how to build and how to make that sustainable system, you need to get lots of ongoing and that is collective action organizations and they need that institutional configuration and resource-based economies often they can bypass because they can get some other ways at the back of room or under the table to get the political leaders to get by. And now it came to the point, even though African grows a lot based on natural resources, now younger generation is really no longer, you know, uh, uh, quiet about it. It's accountability, transparency, and as you said, it's necessary to build a nation state, and globalization requires strong na nation state, market based, corporate rate, finance dominated globalization will not ensure co uh, you know, inclusiveness. It is state, but not necessarily state, big central state, but it had to be built configurations from different so that voice could be heard. That is a sort of story. And it's important, cast natural resource cast stories is very much that it allows political leaders to bypass that important engagement with domestic stakeholders. Sorry, so I, no. I took a long time. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you very much. <laughs> um, so our, our, let's um, have Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, thanks for your very insightful um, questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, the second question that was directed to me, I mean, which is about resolving the puzzle between the North being the poorest and it being um, a major exporter of rice to neighboring countries. Um, I'm not sure you got the point I made um, clearly enough. The North, I mean, I use that particular point in relation to an attempt to debunk the notion that the North is poor because it has bad geography and that it lacks agricultural potential, I mean, which was one of the major reasons being advanced in excluding or in explaining the exclusion of those poorer upper regions from the Millennium Challenge account. In any case, when I said the North being a major exporter of rice, I am not talking of today. I was referring to the 1970s when the North <coughs> used to export rice, when Ghana became self-sufficient in rice, in, 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 in rice um, as well as um, being able to export some quantities, some substantial quantities to neighboring countries. So, 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 so the idea of exportation is not in reference to the, in fact, today Ghana is a major importer of rice. We depend on rice imports. And the question is why? As far as I'm concerned, it goes back to the issue I'm raising. Politics. It's about politics. It's about the power relationship between civil society groups, poor farmers on the one hand, between government, and between donors. You have a situation in which civil society act, I mean, um, organizations are pushing for lowering um, um, the I mean, rise import tariffs. Government is in the middle because donors are not interested in that. In 2003, the rise import tariffs was raised by the um, 2003 national budget to increase it from 20 to 25 percent. This particular law was I mean, this particular um, bill was passed into, uh, into law in parliament shortly but it was implemented for only three days as a result of donor pressure. In fact, we never heard about that law. I mean, when the government announced that the implementation of that particular act was repealed, we never heard about it until 2005 when the cabinet or parliament was convened to repeal that law. And there's a lot of evidence to show that there was a lot of behind the scenes pressures from donor agencies, especially the IMF on ideological grounds and so on and so on. And also, and also partly because I mean, most of the major importers of rice into Ghana um, are those donor countries, the United States and so on and so forth. Ghana is a very big rice market um, for, for, for the United States of America and so on. So, so, so it goes back to the point of politics that I was raising. 
Um, coming back to um, um, Sylvia's points, um, let me start by noting that, yes, colonialism, the, the, the problem of the North-South inequality has to do with history, partly. There are a lot of explanations. My, 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 I mean, the interest I am having is to indicate that those explanations are woefully inadequate and they cannot explain why the situation has persisted till date. The roots of it, the historical, if you, if, if you want to find out the origins of it, yes, colonialism matters. Ghana celebrated its um, 50th anniversary when in 2007. We've been, uh, I mean, we've we gained independence as far back as 1957. A lot has changed. Why hasn't that problem been resolved? That can't be explained by virtue of colonial or historical factors as far as colonialism is concerned. That is one. Secondly, you made a point um, that I think I should correct, that uh, you asked whether I'm a northerner adv advocating for the north. Yes, I am a northerner, but I am not advocating for the north. And in fact, I see northern political elites as a major problem to the development of the north. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt about that. And that, if you, if you look at the conclusions I drew, I said that having marginalized regions being so strongly represented in government is neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition to resolve their developmental backwardness. And in any case, when Ghana became a major exporter of rice in the 1970s, was there a northern president? No. In fact, that was the only regime in which there was no northern representation. So, so we, but I think we need to distinguish between what is idealistic and what is realistic. My, I mean, your points about let us see ourselves as one blah blah and so on, I share in those sentiments. But that is the idealistic aspect of the story. The reality is completely different. And my interest was to add a political dimension to the explanation of spatial inequality. And I mean, if you look at the political settlements framework, I mean, um, Pax and Cole distinguish between broad types two broad types of political settlements. There's the primary political settlements, which is about looking at the national level elites, but there's also the role of subnational, um, the, the role of subnational elites, which he terms as secondary political settlements. And it plays, I mean, if you just focus on, on the North alone, that the North in itself is not a, homo, a, a kind of a homogeneous place. There are a lot of diversity, and in fact, there are a lot of power struggles among the three northern regions. When resources are to be sent to the North, even there are power struggles as to whether it should go to the northern region, the upper east region, or the east or the west region. So, so I am not in any way ex or arguing that the problem about northern Ghana's underdevelopment is about southern political elites. Far from that, nor am I advocating for north. I mean, I'm, I am a no, I'm a, I am a northern academic, not a northern politician. Okay. But, <laughs> as, 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 as I mentioned that there, there, there has been. Um, a southern coalition against the north. That is not. Sorry. sorry. In, your, in, your, in one of your, uh, of your slides, you mentioned that there is a coalition of the south against the north. I saw it. That's okay. why I took the stance that, look, let's get the people who can do the job, not people who are from the regions. And I think I, I commend the present government for the, that stance they've taken, that we are not taking people from the regions to the regions. We are, bringing, we are going to bring people from other regions to develop other regions. That is fair. Okay. Um, just, just a brief, just very, uh, let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> two seconds. Yeah, just two seconds. I think, I think, I, I think you should probably um, look at the slides. Uh, I'm sure they would probably upload them. I don't see any North versus South coalition in Ghana. In fact, if you're talking of coalitions in Ghana, it is about whether you are an NDC or NPP. That is, I mean, what, I mean, it, it depends on which political party you belong to. And northern, northern political elites who belong to the NPP consider themselves as more of NPPs than northerners. That is the reality. And that is why I see northern political elites as being, I mean, forming a very critical part of the, store, I mean, or, of the story or the problem. So there isn't any northern versus southern. I'm talking of dominant elites within a particular ruling coalition. OK? Yeah. Okay. We can continue discussions after. <laughs> um, but let's give the final word to Beatrice. All right, super quickly, since I'm standing between you and lunch and I'm responding to questions about trash, which I think we can all agree is a problem. 
no disagreement there. So just quickly on uh, two points. In terms of the point, the questions related to whether the trash that's being collected is being recycled or composted or um, if it's being sorted by metals, cardboard, plastics, the answer is at the time that I did this study, which was 2008 to 2009, no. It was all combined trash that was being taken directly to an open air dump. Um, the instances in which it was being sorted were two. And I know, Martin, you talked about one yesterday in your presentation, which is uh, scavengers, like the, the idea that the individuals, particularly in Maputo, where the trash uh, density was the highest, um, you had individuals living in the collection sites themselves. So where where the dumpsters were in you know the center center part of town, they'd be living there and taking the plastics out to sell them. So you saw that type of activity, and you also saw um, I interviewed Recicle, which was a South African firm that came into um, this, the Maputo area and started to do this on a commercial basis. So they were working with the city to start it on a commercial basis. So those are the two examples in which you would start to see at least 2008, 2009, some level of recycling occurring, both at the micro level with those individuals living at the sites and then um, with this contract with Recicle, which was a South African firm. Um, very uh, quickly, um, I just wanted to respond to the question about do colonial institutions, and it was directed at uh, Machiko, not, not myself, but do colonial institutions make a difference? In, in uh, Beira, it, um, in Mozambique, it does. Um, what you saw there in terms of 80% uh, of the population is rural, and what you saw in terms of the administrative structures at the subnational level and how they were set up, they were set up um, as colonial institutions to basically be able to control territory from predominantly what we would call urban areas. And so um, even the way that the the, the uh, different heads of the departments were called and the way that the political structure was set up at that level, that all came initially from, from the Portuguese. So that is uh, still in place today. So I don't have anything else to add. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, this is obviously a really exciting set of papers, so please come up and talk to our speakers, take them to lunch, <laughs> continue your questioning. Um, thank you very much.